I am by profession a, f a scientist. What I realized a long time ago was precisely that Leonardo was a scientist. He's been described as the most relentlessly curious person in history and what an apt description. It's one of the reasons why he had this, this uh, uh, reputation for not finishing, not finishing his commissions. He would get sidetracked doing fundamental science. He prefigured Galileo in many cases. He prefigured even Isaac Newton, the greatest scientist of all in some cases. He drew a design for the reflecting telescope 180 years before Newton invented the telescope. He knew the free fall law, the law of free fall, that objects with different masses accelerate at the same constant rate when there is no air resistance. This is, of course, attributed to Galileo. Galileo published it. Leonardo knew it. Leonardo gi gi gives numbers for the position of the body as it goes down. He knew that projectiles would have parabolic trajectories, something that was, again, published by Galileo 120 years after he discovered it. But it's this remarkable um, genius you find in his notes. He's inventing the future. Unfortunately, he didn't publish, so he wasn't influencing the future. If he had published and his notes had gotten into the right hands other gifted scientists in his own time, we could have been at this juncture 200 years ago. Late in the 18th century, I think we would have had this level of technology and this level of science if indeed he had published. As an artist, he's in a special stratosphere with Michelangelo is this notion of the magician or the or the transformative genius. Now all of us know some geniuses, very bright people, and we can usually uh, understand how geniuses are created. They have bright parents, bright parents have bright children. There are more books in the house. There's better interaction in the house. And of the 20 or so Nobel Prize winners that I've met, and a few that I've actually worked with, these are truly gifted individuals. At the end of the day, they're ordinary geniuses. But once in a while you get a transformative genius. These are people who don't follow the normal topography of logic. They seem to go from mountaintop to mountaintop. In art, you never ask about who the greatest artist is. You start ranking at number three. Leonardo and Michelangelo, you can take in either order as number one. Then you have to argue about Rembrandt or Raphael maybe as number three. See, it's that sort of thing. In the sciences, you won't get much argument for the greatest scientist being Isaac Newton. And somewhat below him would be Einstein maybe the last transformative genius, and the man of the 20th century. You might remember the ranking that Time magazine had for the person of the century, and they came up with Einstein as the man of the century. After all, the 20th century was the century of, of science, and he was by far the greatest scientist in the 20th century. When it comes to literature, nobody will argue that the transformative genius is Shakespeare. You start ranking at number two then. Is it Milton or is it one of the great German or Russian writers? Well, this is, this is Leonardo. Leonardo is in the special category, but he's in the same category in every field that he delved in. In the sciences, in the arts. Uh, he was born out of wedlock. He was a love child of a 26-year-old uh, notary public, notary, by the name of Ser Piero Antonio da Vinci, and most likely a 15-year-old chambermaid named Caterina. He was born in 1452. We don't know much of the details except the precise time his grandfather 
wrote in his notes, in his notebooks, a son was born to my son, his name is Leonardo, three hours after sunset. So it must have been about 10 o'clock in the evening that he was born, most likely in Vinci, but it could have been in this village called Anchiano. The first five years of his life, he lived with his mother. The father married someone, and the mother married someone else, of course, but the father married someone who turned out to be barren in the language of the day. And the father came and took the child. The next 10 years, the boy lived with his father. But he had a wonderful champion in his uncle, Alexandro. Alexandro inspired him to study nature, to do uh, anatom anatomical studies of, of lizards and other creatures. When the boy was 15, the family, the paternal family, moved to, to uh, Florence, and there Leonardo became apprentice to, uh, to Verrocchio. This was the perfect fit. Verrocchio, like him, had not been married, he, had, he was an illegitimate child, and, and the name literally means the true eye, Verrocchio. Well, in the uh, studio of Verrocchio, uh, he constantly heard from Verrocchio about learning from nature, learning the body from the inside out, but Verrocchio would have had no idea to what levels Leonardo would go to learn the body from the inside out. Uh, Sherwin Newland, a very fine uh, surgeon at Yale University and the author of a book on Leonardo, uh, wrote in the book that Leonardo was the finest anatomist in history. This is a man who had no education. Uh, he was in the studio as an apprentice for a very long time. He didn't break out on his own till his late 20s, 26, 27. And then, uh, he, a couple of years later, he moved, after he had his own studio, he moved up to Milan as a military engineer. It's not quite clear whether he got the job as a military engineer in the beginning, but he was a very fine lute player, and, the, and Duke Sforza was impressed by this aspect, this, this talent he had. As a bundle of contradictions that he represents, He's a pacifist working as a military engineer.